Aloha, I'm Robert Perkinson. I'm a professor in American Studies at UH Manoa and the director of the Better Tomorrow Speaker Series. And it is my privilege today to be here with one of the foremost scholars of sociology and law in the United States, Dorothy Roberts. She has an endowed chair at the University of Pennsylvania. She's the founder of their program on race, science, and society. Um, Professor Roberts has more research fellowships and accolades than I can count on all of my fingers and toes. She's been elected to the National Academy of Medicine, the American um, Society for Arts and Letters, um, the American Philosophical Association. She's the author of more than 100 articles and four single author books, including this book that we're going to be talking about today, Torn Apart, How the Child Welfare System Destroys Black Families and How Abolition Can Build a Safer World. Um, Dorothy, thank you so much for traveling across a continent and an ocean to join us, and welcome. Thanks, Robert. May I call you Robert? Yes, please do. Okay, May I thank do the same? you. Yes, and uh, it's a pleasure. It's definitely worth the travel to get here to beautiful Honolulu. It's great to have you. Um, your book has a provocative thesis embedded in the title. I think most people think of child welfare systems as programs that might fail, they might be underfunded, but they are designed to help. Um, you argue that they in fact inflict more harm. What do you mean in a base, at a basic level? Well, you're right that there's this popular understanding of the child welfare system, foster care, child protection, even the language suggests that they are all helpful systems that are designed to keep children safe and improve their welfare, to care for them. But in fact, their design is just the opposite. They only come into play when parents and other family caregivers are accused of child maltreatment, which by the way is mostly neglect, which is entangled with poverty. So they are blaming parents for not being able to care sufficiently for their children. Uh, it's a system designed to target the most marginalized families in America, especially black and indigenous families, and almost exclusively poor and low income families. And then it investigates them in a really deeply intrusive way, and it often takes their children away from them. In fact, the main tool that the system has to address the needs of children is to take them from their families, not to provide what families need, and puts them then in a system that we call foster care, a foster industrial complex, really, that is extremely harmful to children. It's well documented to be harmful in terms of the disruptions it causes children, the uh, psychological and emotional and social injuries to children, as well as high rates of physical abuse within foster care. Uh, and many children move from place to place to place. Uh, some are put in very harmful group settings, including facilities that are like prisons where children are locked up uh, because they've been taken from their families and sometimes just because there's nowhere else to put them. And it, it, it uh, diverts our attention from what would truly support families. To connect the larger point to kind of individual stories, is there an illustrative example? I know there are many of them in the book. Yeah, but yeah. A, a, an example that illustrates the sorts of problems that you're talking about? Well, I can point to two stories I tell in the book. I open the book with the story of a young mother named Vanessa Peoples who was undergoing uh, a set of health problems and she was a nursing student at the time. She had two little boys and she was at a family picnic at a park in Aurora, Colorado when her youngest child, a toddler, straight away following her cousin out of the park when her cousin left. And as she ran to catch up with her son, a stranger came by and grabbed her son and called the police on her. And the police arrived uh, because this woman wouldn't give Vanessa back her child and Vanessa wasn't in shape to fight her for her son. 
Uh, and the police gave Vanessa a ticket for child abuse uh, because her child strayed away in front of her for about a minute. Uh, but that didn't end it because now the family was under the scrutiny of the child welfare system. A caseworker came to her house and Vanessa didn't hear when the caseworker knocked on the door. So the caseworker called police to come back up this investigation and three police officers arrived. They wouldn't leave Vanessa's home. And by the way, one of them had a gun drawn on her when she came up from the basement where she had been caring for the children. And eventually seven police officers arrived at her home, knocked her down, hog-tied her, that's, they hobbled her be, with her hand, uh, hands in cuffed behind her, her back in front of her children and her mother, and uh, hauled her off to prison to jail. Uh, she had to plead guilty to a uh, child endangerment charge in order not to go to jail. And now she's in a child abuse registry in Colorado. She cannot work as a nurse, which is what she was training for, and is having trouble finding a job and getting an apartment on her own because landlords have access to this public information. So this encounter with the child welfare system is ex was extremely harmful to her children. Now her children weren't fortunately taken from mm -hmm. her, but in many cases children are taken. Uh, another is a uh, case... Well, and maybe if the media... And the media yes, kind of grabbed on to this they did. story, maybe protecting her, but if she well, hadn't had... Well, exactly. That's the, uh, the, the paradox is the stories we hear about. Mm -hmm. Families are able to get their children back quickly, but in the vast majority of cases, this doesn't reach the media. And so you have hundreds of thousands of children being taken from their families every year without the kind of scrutiny that they should get. Hundreds of thousands. That's a big number. Yes. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I want to hear more about the scale of the problem and yes. then also, um, you know, to what extent you can differentiate between these cases mm -hmm. that involve a lot of, like, subjective assessment of authorities and mm -hmm. cases, you know, like, of egregious yeah. abuse and neglect that's... Yeah putatively these institutions are mm -hmm. designed to prevent. Okay, so every year more than three million children come to the attention of the child welfare system. Now in most of these cases, the investigations lead to unsubstantiated uh, accusations. They may not even lead to investigations. These are so many calls to the child mm -hmm. abuse hotline uh, from mandated reporters, from neighbors, from friends, from people who are just retaliating. This is another problem. Anyone can call and accuse right. someone. But there are uh, three, well, 200,000 official removals of children every year and probably another 200,000 that we don't really have good records of because caseworkers force families to sign what are called safety plans. They're supposed to be voluntary, but they're under threat by caseworkers who say, if you don't sign this plan, which may include taking children away, placing children in other homes, then we're gonna start an official court proceeding against you. And so many parents feel pressured to sign these safety plans and have their children taken from them under the plan. Uh, but we do know that there are over 200,000 children removed every year. Now, investigations, that is a huge number. it's a huge number. Investigations, which, as I mentioned in the case of Vanessa Peoples, for example, are very traumatic encounters where a government agent is coming into your home and inspecting every corner of it. Uh, they are interrogating you and your children, uh, looking into private confidential information, school records, hospital records, other kinds of records, and may even strip search children looking for signs of abuse. And so, and, and also you're afraid that your children are going to be taken from you at the right. end of this encounter. And so uh, these investigations also are an important aspect and, and really terrifying aspect of the system. A recent study found that more than half of black children in America will undergo a child welfare investigation before they reach age 18, 53%. So this is really a significant amount of government intrusion in people's lives. 
And what evidence do we have that the gap between that 200,000 mm-hmm. but could be 400,000 or m- more that are affected yeah, by these intrusive right, investigations, right. how much evidence do we have of the size of the chasm between that and, you know, legitimate serious cases of... Uh- yeah. Abuse and well, neglect. one indication of this is looking at federal statistics about why children enter foster care. And about 17% enter foster care on grounds of child abuse or sexual abuse, physical or sexual abuse. So a minority of children. Right. The less than other, a fifth. It, it, less than a fifth. The vast majority of children in the system, in the foster system, are there on grounds of neglect, which is defined very vaguely by state law. So state law defines neglect as parents' failure to provide some material need of children, housing or clothing or nutrition or medical care. Which can just be being poor. It can I- just be being poor. In Again, this is a system that from the beginning has been designed to deal with the struggles of impoverished families and low-income families. Wealthy families very rarely, no matter what's going on in their homes, mm-hmm. very rarely come into contact with the child welfare system. Let's break it down a little bit, you know, between the economic elements of this and the elements of racial discrimination. Can you describe a little bit more the ways that poverty can lead, can be considered neglect and can lead to child removal, which of course exacerbates all of the problems that might have been present with eviction or other it, oh, consequences exactly, of exactly. Well, you mentioned eviction. So one clear example, and this is a big contributor to child removal, is lack of secure housing. So if a, 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 a homeless shelter, for example, calls the child abuse hotline to report that a family has entered the shelter and caseworkers come to investigate, they may and often do remove the children from the shelter and place them in foster care. And then... Without any other... It may be without any other other factor. So it it may be in some places they may be offered some kind of referral to uh, a government program that might help them. But we know that there isn't sufficient affordable housing in America and there are hundreds of thousands of people who are unable to provide adequate housing for their families. Some unfortunate ones get uh, called on by child, uh, by mandated reporters, or uh, they come to the attention of the child welfare system. And in those cases, they very often experience family separation. Uh, and, but it might also be because a teacher is called because a child has inadequate clothing, or they see that a child uh, is, or is getting poorly late for school nourished. or falling behind. Well, all falling of which behind, could happen if you're all, living in a shelter. Every single, all of that, uh, falling behind in school, not coming to school on time, having a health problem, a mental health problem, or physical health problem, all of these, which it's harder for impoverished families and low-income families to deal with these problems that right. children have. And the system, instead of providing what these families need, its tool is to take children away and then mandate that parents engage in all sorts of activities to prove they're deserving of their children. Many all of, of which, which may be very hard to comply with if you are trying to work two jobs. or Absolutely. You're, you're trying to find housing. Belongings. It, exactly. Very difficult. And the main, it, if you look at what happens to families, what they're ordered to do, almost always the number one thing is parental training classes. So they have to go to parental training classes, which takes up time and does absolutely nothing to help them with the material needs mm-hmm. that they have. Uh, also, another big one is drug treatment failed drug treatment programs that they're forced to go into, sometimes even if they don't have a drug problem or if they've gotten over a drug problem, they still have to go to these. Their children might be placed in different parts of the city. They have to go to mandated visits right. with their children. So the the kinds of responses that the system offers are impediments to taking care of families not uh, and not any kind of resource that truly helps them. Yeah, a key point, I think, is that when one of these 
authority figures, social workers shows up, they have this awesome power of government to remove a child, but not to hand out vouchers for housing. Exactly. For... Exactly. Exactly. That is the main tool they rely on. Either they take the children or they threaten to take the mm -hmm. children if parents and other family caregivers don't comply. Uh, and another way, I think it's important to understand that this system interferes with true care for families is that it turns professionals that are trained to care for children, like doctors and nurses, other healthcare professionals, teachers, uh, social workers, into mandated reporters. So these people are told they have to report their suspicions of child abuse and neglect. And they may think they're helping children, but then the response is, instead of these professionals being supported and given the resources to help families, they turn families over to a system that's not going to help them. Now, this brings us maybe to the ways that racism can function in the system, which, yes. like when a teacher, a doctor, a nurse has to make, or a police officer has to make a decision about whether X bruise or um, why number of tardies to school constitutes some sort of neglect. Your book suggests that evidence is quite clear that that decision making, whether they know it or not, is racially informed to the core. Yes, there is a mountain of evidence, very well constructed studies that show over and over again that doctors, teachers, social workers make decisions about whether a child is at risk of abuse or neglect based on racist stereotypes. And they may not realize it, but whether they do or not, this is borne out by studies. And it's only natural to think this, that we have a society that is rife with racial stereotypes, especially about black families, the stereotype that black parents don't really care for their children, uh, that the, the black welfare queen, the black uh, crack addict, you know, the black crack baby, all of these stereotypes of black mothers especially who don't really have a loving bond with their children. And studies have also borne out this idea in decision making that black children are better off away from their families. Uh, we know that it takes less risk to a child for a caseworker to remove a black child than a white child. We know that doctors are more likely to suspect black mothers of drug use and to test black newborns at hospitals than white newborns. We know that... Even though the evidence is overwhelming that white people actually use drugs at higher exactly. rates, just in more private settings yes. and with less public scrutiny. Yes, but study after study show that, black, that doctors are more likely to test black pregnant people for drug use and black newborns for drug use. Uh, so multiple studies show this and and we know we know that these stereotypes exist and that they are one of the foundations of this punitive approach to child welfare that the answer is to take children away and put them in a substitute care monitored by the government rather than support families so they can stay at home which is as you point out a very big penalty Yes. Like it's kind of the, of family law, it's kind of like the death penalty of family law. Exactly. Family, well, for removal. many of these families, especially again, black and indigenous families in America, the end of this is permanent termination of parental rights, where the, a court ends the legal relationship between children and their families. These children can now be adopted by strangers, and uh, they no longer have a right to a relationship with their parents and other family members. And this has been called the death penalty of the civil system as opposed to the criminal system. But for, you know, for many people, and many parents have said this, I would rather spend time in jail than have my children taken from me. So would, it, so would almost anyone. Yeah. I was struck by a personal story you related in your mm -hmm. book that I thought showed the ways that just in a very small, it was a small incident with your youngest child at the time yes. missing a lot of school. Yes. And it kind of showed the way that race and class both can 
function. I don't know if you yeah, might sure. share it. Sure. Well, he didn't really miss a lot of school, okay. but he did miss <laughs> some school. So I, 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 at the time, I was uh, teaching at Northwestern Law School uh, in in Chicago, living in Evanston, Illinois, and my son was in kindergarten at a public uh, kindergarten there. And uh, it, during the parent-teacher conference, the first one we had, the teacher looked at me and said, your son was away uh, for uh, several days in November. He was actually with me on a trip to England where I gave a talk at University of Kent, and my daughter at the time was... Uh, doing her junior year abroad in London. And so it was a, a nice uh, family trip, but also a very educational trip for him. I, I think it's important for children to travel, and I thought this was a great opportunity for him. Well, the teacher was upset because he missed the Thanksgiving a program where she showed me the headbands. They were going to put feathers in headbands and pretend they were Native Americans. Oh, dear. You know, and uh, she and she said to me, "If your son misses more school, I'm going to call a truancy officer on you, and he's going to come to your home to investigate." And my first thought was. She is doing saying this to me. This happened to be a white teacher. She was saying this to me because she thought I didn't understand the importance of education. Right. Uh, she didn't know who I was, and I think she looked at me as a black mother who thought it was okay to take her son out of school. She didn't know why, also, yeah. that I had taken him from school. Uh, and so uh, she... Uh, thought that she needed to lecture me about the importance of education and also threaten me with sending a truancy officer to my uh, to, to my home. You know, I also have had children who have gone to fancy private schools. Uh, in actually, in that that same time, I had older children. And uh, they actually didn't like it at the, at the private school. I took them out to go to Evanston Township High School. But they had a, a year in this fancy private school. And there were children in that school. There was a tennis star, for example, who missed school right. you know, weeks and weeks of school. I'm sure that they did not send a truancy officer to this wealthy girl's school right. to, to report on her. Now, the other part of the story, though, is that later in the year, my, the, the children were supposed to put together a little picture book about some important aspect of their lives. And my son put together a picture book of trips around the world he had made with me. Uh, he happened to have gone, this child, to 20 countries <laughs> wow. on you know various lectures I was giving around the world. And, uh, and he loved it. He loved it. And I thought, again, this is so, what a wonderful opportunity for him to have. And uh, I, the next time I met with the teacher, she was exclaiming how wonderful this picture book was and how lucky my son was. And her attitude had changed completely. Yeah. And all I could think of, and I, I'm sure this is true, that she looked me up and found I was a professor at Northwestern Law School. And all of a sudden, I changed from this black ne negligent mother who didn't understand the value of kindergarten to a professor who was now acceptable. And so my child's absence from school now was no longer child neglect, but a benefit. And this is an important part of this system because it doesn't just punish impoverished people because they're harming their children. It punishes them because they're poor. Be because the very same kinds of things that a wealthy white parent would do be away from home for long periods mm -hmm. of time, take their child out of school for whatever reason, have children with mental health problems or behavioral problems, uh, have a drug problem or an alcohol problem, all of those problems that wealthy families have, have a child who strays away from them mm -hmm. you know, in a park. They're not seen as child maltreatment. They're seen as needs that children have that are dealt with through private means because the parents can't afford it. Whereas the same thing that a an impoverished parent does with more warrant because they're tr struggling to try to care for their children. 
those are seen as child abuse and neglect. And, and they're punished for it instead of providing the resources, the same resources that fa wealthy families have, all children should have, all families should have, and they shouldn't be punished just because they can't afford to provide these things for their children. You argue that this isn't just kind of um, well-meaning institutions that have strayed from mission. Yeah. but that um, the kind of discriminatory management of families by government is kind of baked in historically. And I, I, I had, even though I'm a historian of yeah. criminal justice institutions, yeah. Yeah. I kind of had naively thought that child welfare institutions, the genealogy of them traced back to private charities and the right. progressive era, yes. well-meaning, <laughs> if often failing institutions, but yes. you trace it you trace these efforts really back to much more coercive kinds of institutions, and I wonder if you might yeah, elaborate. Sure, sure, and I'm, I'm glad you raised that because the propaganda that this system puts out there is that its origins are in well-meaning charities that were saving children mm -hmm. from uh, prior harsher forms of uh, orphanages and asylums and that kind of thing. Uh, and also that it now has a lineage to today of uh, 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 child protection and child care, whereas the real origins of the system are in the enslavement of African people uh, where white enslavers had authority over black families and could separate them at will for any reason to pay off a debt, for an inheritance, for a gift, to punish families. And this happened routinely to families that even on the auction block, the mother and father could be sold to separate purchasers, the children could be sold off separately depending on the economic needs and wants of the white enslavers. And this, these were ordered by courts. Uh, then after slavery ended and a white supremacist campaign was inflicted on black people to virtually re-enslave them uh, with uh, the convict leasing system, with uh, uh, chain gangs and false charges against black people to put them en masse into prisons, which abolitionists you know, have, have taught us about. But this, something similar happened with black children, which we hear less about. Through the apprenticeship system, White people could petition judges to say that black parents were neglecting their children, and tens of thousands of black children, right after the Civil War, were put back into forced labor for white former enslavers. Uh, so that is a court system that, based on allegations of neglect, took children from their black families and put them into work for white people. That is a, a formal, a formal foundation for today's child welfare system when it comes to black people. And then and you look at Indian boarding schools well, too. Well, yes, exactly. So at the same time, in the late, uh, the second half of the 1800s, the U.S. government was waging so-called Indian wars against Native tribes to dispossess them of their land. And a military tactic that they began was to forcibly remove. Native children from their homes and put them initially into military camps, mm -hmm. military detention. Uh, this led to the boarding school movement or boarding school uh, campaign where uh, Native children en masse were t forcibly removed and put into white dominated boarding schools. Eventually, in the 20th century, until the Indian Child Welfare Act was passed in the 1970s, this was an official policy of the U.S. government, uh, the adoption policy in cahoots with the Child Welfare League of America to find Native families neglectful through the formal child welfare system and remove them at such large numbers that it even destroyed some Native tribes because so many children were taken from the tribe and put into white-dominated orphanages and place for adoption with white families. And even that progressive era, this idea that, uh, well, actually a little prior to the progressive era, but the 
the beginnings of the formal foster system for white children, uh, this was not completely charitable. I mean, they, these children were taken from impoverished immigrant families predominantly in cities along the East Coast and forced to work for so-called foster families. Uh, they, in fact, even the, the origin story you hear about a little girl they marry who was being abused in a home and uh, the, the um, uh, Animal Welfare League uh, or they, they used animal welfare uh, authorities to save her. She had been taken from her family, and that was a foster home she was in where she was being abused. So even the origin story is a story of a child taken from her family and placed in an abusive foster home. Uh, in addition, the very people that began this supposedly saving and, and protective system created what we call orphan trains. They, they're trains with hundreds of children who were shipped from cities like New York to the Midwest and the Southwest to work on strangers' farms. You know, the, that, the, and they were called orphan trains, but they were mm -hmm. actually filled with children who were taken from their families, from impoverished families uh, who instead of providing help for the families, these children were put on trains to work for strangers. It's interesting this is happening to immigrant children and immigrant families without papers right now. That's right. That That's right. Well, if, if you look... All these kids are turning up working in meatpacking factories. Yes, and, exactly. I mean, if on. you look at the history, the real history of the child welfare system and the way in which impoverished immigrant, margin, any marginalized groups are treated in America. It's not a benevolent system of support. It's exploitation and placement of these children in harmful, either forced work or prison-like settings, or even the best of foster care is still disruptive to children. So- Hugely, imagine that. Yeah. Yeah. Trauma being removed from your family, changing schools, exactly changing rules, all of your expectations, yeah. everyone you know, your friends, your you might community. be separated from your siblings. Yeah, it's an extremely traumatic situation with long lasting harms to children. Right, all at the time when your brain is developing most quickly. Yes, and yes, and that's most vulnerable to trauma. That's part of the reason why we see high rates of prison uh, in incarceration of children who either age out of the system or have experience with the foster system that and and it's it's the trauma but it's also the way in which the foster system puts children in situations of conflict where if when they break rules when they run away or when they get in fights uh, with other children or with staff the response is a punitive response to them, and they're often put into the juvenile delinquency system, uh, or, you know, arrested, uh, and children who are before juvenile court judges, if they're in the foster system, are treated more harshly than children who aren't in the foster system. And that's kind of another thrust of your argument, really, that, again, the ways that the popular perceptions you endeavor to turn upside down. But another one of those perceptions is that, you know, government approaches to social problems might be thought of as divided into soft power approaches like assistance and yes. social services or hard power, mm -hmm. um, policing and prisons. Right. Most people think of child protective services as falling on the soft power side, but yeah. you argue there's a lot more entanglement. Yes. And in fact, you end up calling it a family policing system yes. rather than... So tell yes. us about the ways that you think child welfare policy, malign neglect, really yes. is entwined with the development of mass incarceration. Yeah, it's entwined on so many levels. <laughs> um, as I've indicated, it's entwined historically. The buildup of prisons parallels the buildup of the foster system. And in both cases, that skyrocketing of the prison population and the foster population are because of the 
gross disproportionate placement of black people in these systems. Uh, and I would say also, if we look at the kinds of rhetoric and, uh, and propaganda and arguments for these systems, they're based on similar kinds of stereotypes about black people, and including something I've studied a lot, black mothers' mm -hmm. supposed transfer of dangerous lifestyles to their children. So there's that. Uh, there's also just the practical entanglement of police and caseworkers. Uh, they get trained together in some places. Uh, they work together, as I mentioned in the story of Vanessa Peoples. They investigated her home together, caseworkers and police officers. They violated her physically. You know, the, the violence was perpetrated by police officers backing up caseworkers. Uh, very often when caseworkers remove children, this is a, a violent situation. You have yeah. caseworkers physically tearing children away, screaming, crying children from their terrified parents. And caseworkers often call police officers, especially if they're going into a black neighborhood, to back them up with armed force to inflict this violence on families. Uh, and then there's the logic of it, the logic that the way in which to deal with the unmet needs of struggling families is through carceral punitive means. We can look at prisons as a response to the crises in struggling communities of lack of employment, of structural racism, of structural barriers to participating fully in society, the answer is to cage people. And similarly with the family policing system, it's to take children away from their families. And then there's policy entanglements as well. I point out in Torn Apart, if you look at the 1990s, uh, an era of growing neoliberalism, relying on private accumulation of capital as the goal of you know the economy and and the the government, uh, and the shrinking of investment in in the public. Uh, there were three laws that were passed, one right after another, the crime control bill. Uh, and I should say all passed under, by, Clinton. under Cl a Democratic President Clinton, yeah. the crime control bill that expanded prisons and expanded police presence in black communities. Uh, then after that was the welfare restructuring law that ended the federal entitlement to welfare, uh, which had existed you know, for decades and turning it into basically a behavior modification system that in includes all sorts of limits and and, and the, the, the idea that the way to deal with poverty, especially poverty of unwed black mothers who were being targeted by this restructuring, is to force them into low-wage work, get them married, and deter them from having children. And, and the sorts of subsidies that wealthier families get, like mortgage interest deduction, for right. example, yes. aren't subject to any of that kind exactly. of scrutiny. Exactly, exactly. You just get those benefits. Exactly. And then another law that was passed a year after the welfare restructuring law, the Adoption and Safe Families Act, again, gets less attention, but it's absolutely entangled with these others, is a law that was designed to deal with this massively burgeoning foster care population. At the time, most the largest group of children in foster care were black children. Even though black children were a minority of children in America, they were 40% of children in foster care. You know, maybe anywhere, maybe 12, 13% of children in America, but it's so a huge racial disparity there. And the answer was not to reduce the numbers of children entering foster care, you know, not to get the kinds of generous supports that families need, but the opposite, to speed up termination of parents' rights. And these were seen as black mothers, you know, who are undeservedly holding on to their rights of children in foster care, terminate their rights. So the law speeds up the, the, the petitioning for termination of parental rights 
and it gives bonuses to states for increasing the numbers of children adopted in the state every year. So it's an incentive for adoption, an incentive to speed up termination of parental rights without any parallel incentive to keep families together. Well, and two other trends going on at this time in Mm -hmm. the late 20th century. One, you know, the housing crisis become explodes and yeah. evictions yes. soar. Yes. Um, and also, you know, even though more men are incarcerated as incarceration goes through the roof, mm-hmm. the rate of imprisonment of black women grows faster than any other group. That's right. Yeah. And that's another way, presumably, that children are um, yes. being removed from the home because the that's parent right. is removed from the... It, exactly. Exactly. So during that time, we see a doubling of the foster care population in large part because of the removal of children from black mothers who were being prosecuted and being incarcerated. Uh, Yes, incarceration is a driver of child removal because when people are incarcerated, it's hard to take care of your children. And even if it's for three days, that could be enough, I presume, to trigger. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And under the Adoption Safe Families Act, some judges treat incarceration for more than uh, 15 months. That's the, the, uh, the line that uh, the Adoption Safe Families Act creates as per se grounds to terminate parental rights. Oh, meanwhile, all the sentences were expanded during this period, yeah. so you could get 15 months for not much. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's it's you know it's part of the war on drugs to not only arrest people, uh, and disproportionately black people, really targeting black communities for uh, arrest for drug possession, but also uh, uh, taking their children away from them on grounds of drug possession. And this continues today, even in places that have legalized marijuana use. Children are being removed from impoverished uh, black indigenous families on grounds of evidence of well, also those, marijuana and, use. And those uh, arrest records haven't been expunged in most jurisdictions either. Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, so you see how <laughs> all yeah. of this is deeply, deeply entangled with each other. In a certain sense, you wrote this book 20 years ago. Yes. Um, I mean, you came out with a forceful critique of the child welfare system and its its entwinement with racism and um, punishment of mm-hmm. poverty. Mm-hmm. That book gave you a lot of influence, actually. It seems like mm-hmm. you were invited or allowed into the room where the decisions were being made and you were involved in national efforts to reform these systems, national lawsuits. Yeah, um, yeah. But it sounds like from this book that that experience was less empowering and more disappointing and i'm yeah like what went wrong yeah that's that's right because presumably that's what we want uh, yes influence to be able to bring good ideas you're you're right you're right it was because shattered bonds which uh, was published in 2001 was the really the only book that had been written since the 1970s about the experience of black families and the child welfare system and was a a book that shone a light on the racism of the system uh, as systems began to be forced to grapple with these very blatant racial disparities. There, There was no hiding. In fact, I was shocked that there wasn't more attention paid to it because as the, at the time, as I mentioned, black children were the largest group of children in foster care, four times as likely to be taken from their families as white children. So it's very blatant. In Chicago, for example, where I wrote Shattered Bonds, almost all the children in foster care were black. More than 90% of the children were black. So you couldn't avoid this. But what happened was, as I engaged in multiple kinds of reform efforts, the goal was to reduce the number of children in foster care or to fix these problems. Uh, I, I was involved for nine years in a class action lawsuit against the state of Washington for violating the constitutional rights of children in foster care, trying along with four other experts to fix the system. And the kinds of things that we engaged in were you know, better 
uh, algorithms for caseworkers to figure out who, which children were at risk, training for foster parents, um, more money to, uh, for more caseworkers, but nothing that got at the, the root of the problem, which is that this is a system that is based on accusation, investigation, and tearing families apart. That all changed. I, I'm sorry, that all stayed the same. Right. That all stayed the same. And so as long as that stayed the same, I continue to see families that were being just brutalized by this system for, you know, needlessly. I did not see any kind of paradigm change where the system now is designed to support rather than punish. And it became very clear to me that this system is designed to destroy families. It's designed to control the most marginalized families. It, 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 it's not designed to universally support families. It, it targets the most marginalized families in a way that they don't want. How can you say you have a system that's supportive when families are terrified of this system? Even the mandated reporters, many of them, think that they're going to help families and are shocked when they find out that the children they thought they were going to help are now being harmed by a foster system. So by you know, 20 years later, uh, there was some call for me to do a, a 20th anniversary edition of Shattered Bonds, maybe update the statistics, write a new preface. And I thought about it and it, I needed to write a new book because I didn't want to have as my call in Shattered Bonds a, ref, a call for reform. I did use the word abolition but then I said, replace it with a better system. Mm -hmm. And 20 years later, I recognized more deeply because of the reform work I had done, and also because I understood more about principles of abolition from the prison industrial complex it abolition movement. It sounds like you were movement. moved also by black mothers themselves Absolutely. kind of organizing. Yes, that, that's the, the another key aspect that over those 20 years, black mothers were a more powerful force in organizing to abolish the system. I had worked with black mothers, and this was an important part of my work uh, when I wrote Shattered Bonds, but at that time, they had not developed the capacity to organize in a way that could really make a change. And uh, and and independently of being supported by the child welfare system. Uh, now there were black mothers who had been impacted by the system, who had lost their children and were fighting for radical change, like Joyce McMillan, who founded an organization in New York City called JMAC for Families. Uh, and I got to know Ms. McMillan and others who were working on legislative efforts and uh, had, were much bolder in saying, this system needs to be dismantled completely. We need a radically different approach. And so all of that was the basis for me writing Torn Apart and becoming part of an abolitionist movement instead of a reformist movement. Yeah, and, and so what does that mean practically to move from tinkering yeah. to dismantling? Yes. Um, Maybe explain in practice a little bit what sure. that might entail. Sure. Well, an important part of it is the vision of what you're working toward. So with reform, you're working toward fixing the system. You mm -hmm. think the system is needed. You think it's basically okay. It just has some problems, some flaws. Training, funding. Exactly. More. A uh, key is we need more funding for this system because it's good. It just doesn't have enough resources to uh, do what it's designed to do. Whereas an abolitionist approach recognizes that the system is fundamentally designed to harm 
people, to harm the most vulnerable, marginalized people in the nation. And so we don't want that system to exist. We need to work incrementally to reducing its power, but at the same time, building on what will replace it, uh, building up the kinds of resources that families need that will prevent the perceived need to take children away from their families. So the goal is a horizon we're working toward. It, this isn't going to happen overnight. It, it's it's going to take a lot of work. But how can we build a society that believes it would be unimaginable to support families by tearing them apart, where that just doesn't make sense because we don't we don't need that. <laughs> you know, families the, are supported. The horizon point is a good one, I think, and it's an important moment to remind people of that statistic, which is that more than four-fifths of the removals are not even triggered in response to allegations, yeah. much less proven occurrences yeah. of um, maltreatment mm -hmm. or sexual abuse or mm -hmm. violence. So mm -hmm. there is a lot of abolition that could take place before you get to the hard cases, I guess yes. would be the point that That's I would. That's right. Well, th there's a lot, <laughs> exactly. Uh, the vast majority of children who are in foster care today would not need to be there if their families were supported. In fact, there was a study showing that a large percentage off the top of my head, I don't remember the exact percentage, but it was substantial, of children could leave foster care today if their families had secure housing. So d even just housing, but also uh, the kinds of income that people need. We know now, f we have a, 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 you know, what I guess economists call a natural experiment <laughs> where uh, we could see what happened with COVID, where families were given concrete income support during Child the lockdown. Child poverty was cut in half. Child poverty cut in half. And in cities like New York City, where there's clear evidence, there was no increase in child abuse during that period because families were supported not only by government checks, but also by mutual aid networks that sprung into action and provided concrete resources for families. So. It, it's absolutely clear to me and many, many others that if we had better supports for families, we would not even perceive a need to have to take children away from them. Their needs would be met and children would be removed on grounds of failure of parents to meet their needs. Now, that does leave cases of uh, sexual and physical abuse but we also know... Or different types of a ne neglect, really serious mental illness. Very serious violence. neglect where the rare cases where parents deliberately neglect their children, uh, even though they have the resources to provide for their children, which is extremely rare. And also, child fatalities are rare. Uh, and as we see in Hawaii recently, they occur for children who've been taken from their families and put in substitute care as well. Yeah. So we would reduce those fatalities of children in foster mm -hmm. care if they weren't put in foster care in the first place. Plus, we know that violence in homes is also connected to economic stress. So if that economic stress were removed, we would also greatly remove the number of children who are physically abused in the home. Right, early childhood education, for example, is a great investment that evidence shows for reducing child maltreatment, not yes. because of mandatory reporting, but because right. the kids have extra food, yes. the parents get a little bit of a break. Exactly. Um, the kids have a different social circle. Yeah. You know, it's a... Yes, and then we could also do what wealthy parents have. They have the kinds of psychological supports, that mental health care supports, drug treatment support, that you know, high quality that wealthy people can pay for in private resources. So if we provided that kind of high quality mental health care, drug treatment, uh, treatment for other kinds of substance abuse disorders, that would also reduce the numbers of children subjected to abuse. Uh, and, you know, it's hard to know how much we then would be able to horizon. do that. We would be way over right. the horizon. And also, then there's also 
tens of thousands of children who are not traumatized by removal for economic circumstances who aren't on pathways toward imprisonment. Yes, um, exactly. Who might have better social and parenting skills themselves yes, down the road. So. Exactly. Yes, yeah. there's just so many positive ramifications of actually supporting families instead of punishing them that it's it it's hard to know exactly, you know, when this could happen, what the exact steps to order would be, but I think there's irrefutable evidence that we would see a reduction even in violence in homes if we had a radically different approach to child welfare than we have now. Well, and I think it's a smart move to think of abolition as an orientation yes. rather than a fully understood destination. Yes, that's right. How we're trying to undo centuries of ideas, you know, the, these carceral logics about how to support families. And so it's also going to take changing that way of thinking that many Americans have that poverty is the fault of impoverished people, that uh, our nation shouldn't be truly committed to ending poverty. Uh, not to mention the racist ideologies that have persisted in America for hundreds of years. You know, all of that has to be undone. And that is maybe, you know, certainly decades worth of work, but that's a reason to start now. You know, that's not a reason to say it's impossible. You know, that I get that response sometimes where people will say, well, this is just impossible, so uh, we should reject an abolitionist approach. Well, one thing to think about is that we had slavery in America for hundreds of years and an abolitionist movement, including the rebellions of enslaved people, but a multiracial abolitionist movement as well, was able to abolish slavery. Now, we still have a lot, you know, we haven't But it was developed. a historic and amazing achievement. Absolutely, we can't, we can't downplay the importance of ending the, a, a nation built on the forced labor of people and the ideology that it was acceptable to enslave human beings. Of course, that's meditation. We still have work to do. I think the abolitionist movement now to end family policing is part of that continued legacy. But we have historical evidence that mass movements can radically change deeply embedded ways of thinking. And so I think we should continue the abolitionist legacy that began with the abolition of slavery and the fight for that and continue that today. We cannot also leave families in this terroristic system where families are being deeply harmed every day. Why? I just don't understand why we would want to keep that when there's so much evidence that we can have a better way of supporting families and better ways of keeping children safe and improving their welfare. You've done so much to lay out the roadmap for how we might begin making those changes and also provide the information and the thought structuring that could support those mass movements and give mm -hmm. them the force they need to make real change. So thank you for that important work, a lifetime really of work that you've been doing on this issue. Yes, it has been my entire, my entire career has been working on parts of this issue. It's interesting how I think my first book, Killing the Black Body, which I began with an investigation and protest against the prosecutions of black mothers for being pregnant and using drugs is so connected to the work I'm doing now. Uh, but I think it is, you know, it's a, a an honor and a privilege to be able to spend a career on something I feel very passionate about and to engage closely with other people who are also devoting their lives to making our society a, a better one that is truly caring and loving and is one we want to live in. 
I, I don't think that many people want to live in the society we have now, you know, that we know that there's a better way of generously supporting all families. And I think that's, that's what we need to work toward. We just have to believe that it can happen, that we can contribute to it. And I think history shows us that, that we can. Well, it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you Thank today. You. Thank you for your research, for your advocacy, for your vision. Thanks for coming to Hawaii for this conference. And My pleasure. Um, it, was, it was great talking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, too. I appreciate it. And we'll see the rest of you. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you soon. Ahoi ho.